Today, I am so excited to welcome Dr. Roy Wilkins to Hope Survives podcast. Welcome, Dr. Wilkins. Thank you. Hi, thank you for allowing me to talk to you. Appreciate it. Thank you for coming on. So Dr. Wilkins is an expert in sleep medicine, and today we're going to talk all about sleep and the importance of sleep to brain health and how it relates to sleep after brain injury. So to start out, Dr. Wilkins, can you introduce yourself a little bit, share why you're so passionate about sleep? Okay, I, I will. I, hopefully I can give you the brief synopsis here. Uh, I am a, by training, I'm a chiropractic neurologist, and I have been exclusively doing sleep medicine for the last almost 20 years, since 2003. So I've been uh, just doing sleep. That's all I do. I used to do uh, general neurology and, and do all the stuff that uh, the other neurologists would do, but um, I was involved in an accident years ago. I uh, had on collision where I was personally had a traumatic brain injury and find myself woke up in the hospital about four days later. And uh, it uh, led me to an introduction to some people that uh, tried to encourage me to do sleep. And the more I looked into it, I said, hey, I can do this. And so I was uh, fortunate enough to able to do uh, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine's Waiver B Sleep Fellowship Program. I did that back uh, years ago uh, with a prominent physician that uh, was one of the first in sleep medicine uh, in the nation. And so I felt really, really uh, privileged to be able to do that. And since that time, I've been doing sleep medicine ever since. And, and uh, I enjoy it. I, I like it. That's great. Can you share a little bit on how your traumatic brain injury experience affected you? The first thing it did it, you know, obviously I, I spent some time in the hospital. I, I was unconscious for about four days. Uh, I remember coming to and had no idea where I was. And uh, it was interesting. It was when I had uh, my neuropsych evaluation in the hospital, I did pretty poorly. Uh, they tell me later that I scored at a pretty low level way below my level of education. And, uh, and of course I did therapy and things in the hospital. And I remember one day the therapist or, or the doctor came in and I said, I wanna go home. I'd been in the hospital for 10 days. I said, let me out of here, I wanna go home. And she said, listen, you've got to, um, we'll see how you do tomorrow when you do your uh, neuropsych evaluation. Let's just see how you do. And so I, I did that. And then of course, that's a several hour procedure. And I remember doing that. And I remember when I get, we got done, um, the doctor just looked across at me and she just stared at me. And I said, oh no, I flunked, didn't I? And she goes, no. She goes, we don't see this very often. She said, I, uh, she said, you should be, Patients like you that have had traumatic injuries like you, she said, they're still in the hospital months, weeks, sometimes longer. She said, I don't know how to explain this. She said, you're back to normal. Now, of course, they released me. I, I was not back to normal. Uh, there were some things that was... Uh, uh, obviously some residual things that uh, I've noticed. And I actually have some residuals from that, from that hedgery. In fact, uh, one of the residuals that I have now is I have a right superior quadrantinopia, which means that this upper field of vision right up here in this upper quadrant, I don't see very well. And so I'm, if things are in that, that plane, I, I can actually bump my head and, and not even know that those things are there. So I was left with some residual things from a brain injury, but uh, for the most part, I recovered. And uh, one of the things that obviously at that time uh, that really helped me, interestingly enough, is music. Isn't that crazy? Uh, I could not, I'm a big country Western fan. I love country music, but I couldn't listen to country music. Uh, I couldn't listen to the, you know, hip hop stuff. It just drove me nuts. The thing that calmed me down the most was the classical and the and hymns, 
believe it or not. And I would spend hours uh, listening to the hymns. Now, one of the things that occurred in my in my injury is not only did I have a head injury, but I had I had fractured my femur, and it was in uh, about twelve pieces, and so it was held together by a rod and stuff. And so I I had some other injuries, and I had chest injury and abdominal injury and knee injury and back injury and, and some other things. But it was really interesting mentally. Uh, I really, in those initial days, that's what calmed me down the most. That's what soothed me. That's what made me feel at peace was, interestingly enough, listening to hymns. I couldn't watch TV. It, it drove me nuts. Uh, I couldn't read. I, I remember trying to read and, and the words were jumping on the pages and I just, I couldn't read. But I remember listening to music, and that was that was that was awesome. But uh, long story short, um, as I recovered, uh, I used to rent an office from a a gentleman that had a, a medical supply company, and he said, he said, Doctor Wilkins, he said we really need someone to do sleep medicine. He goes, we don't have anybody up here to do it. And I said, well, you know, I was trained a little bit in it, but I, I really don't know that much. And he said, no, you should do it. And so I looked into it and, and then of course applied for a fellowship and, and was able to do that and was introduced some, to some good people and was able to do that. But ever since then, I've just dealt with sleep and, and it's been uh, it's been both very rewarding and, and of course it's been very therapeutic for me because I had a, a brain injury, you know? Yeah, wow. Thank you for sharing some of your story. So. What year was it that you had your brain injury? That was back in 98. Wow. 1998. That was a it's long time so, ago. It's so interesting. I had my traumatic brain injury in 2007. And it's interesting what you said about the neuropsych report and how they would say you're normal, but yet you still have all these problems well, yeah, and, and effects. And, you know, the way that brain injury medicine has changed over the last even 10, 15 years is incredible what they can do now as opposed to what they could even do in 2007 because the neuropsych doesn't show everything. You know, it doesn't <laughs> no, it show doesn't. that no. you might have trouble making decisions on what to get <laughs> dressed in the morning or, you know, having getting overwhelmed. You know, it's it's exactly. Uh, yeah, there were stressful situations that it's like, I can't stand this anymore. I remember. I, I used to be the party person and uh, and not to blow up my own skirt, but I, I was kind of like the life of the party. And after my brain injury, when we get in loud, large crowds, I could I could stand it for a while. But after a while, I just like I can't stand this. I got to go. I got to go be by myself. And yeah. so I would just get up and leave. And initially uh and prior to my wife understanding what was going on um she was a little bit upset about that and said you know it was kind of concerned for me and i just said i just can't take this i have to i i, I need some alone time i can't stand these crowds now obviously that's gotten better over the years and, and things like that but initially uh the things that i used to do i just couldn't do anymore and 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 so it really affected my my personality and, and things, which was was kind of crazy. Yeah, I can definitely relate, and I'm sure our listeners can too. And it's so interesting because it's so um, I don't want to say subjective, but it's so hard to find any concrete way to explain the way that a brain injury affects you. And I just appreciate you sharing your story with that. And I love hearing about the music. I know this is our first time talking together besides our phone call before this. But um, I'm, I started writing music after my brain injury. And I really? never wrote songs before. Yeah. And wow. music was a huge part of my healing process in my injury. So as you were saying that how much music helped you, so I was not, just like... I'm not talented that way to write <laughs> music. I can listen and I can enjoy, but I'm, I'm not talented to write. So that's, that's a special gift you have. Thank you. It's just, it's amazing how the brain can heal over time and recover and the neuroplasticity that, you know, we can do. So thank you for sharing your story and how you got into sleep medicine and having a traumatic brain injury. Now let's talk about sleep. I, okay. 
This was one of the most requested topics after season one. I put out to the listeners, hey, what would you like to hear about in season two? And sleep was one of the highly requested topics from a lot of yeah. different people because after a brain injury, sleep can be affected. Sometimes people find themselves sleeping more and not able to wake up. And then other times people can't sleep and can't get to sleep and can't stay asleep. So exactly. today I would love to talk about some of those effects of sleep with brain injury. And I also want to learn about why is sleep important? What is the importance of sleep on brain health in general? So maybe we could start there and then okay. move into some of the specifics with brain injury. Sure, sure. Um, one of the things that was discovered uh, years ago is we didn't, in, in sleep medicine and sleep in general, it wasn't quite sure how the brain eliminated its waste products. We weren't quite sure how that happened. Um, but there were some uh, brilliant scientists and things that were able to show that the brain actually has developed a, um, a they call it the G lymphatic system. It's a, it's like a lymph system. The lymph system in our bodies removes waste products and things, you know, from our different tissues and stuff like that. And then, and then of course, it's emptied out. Uh, we weren't quite sure how that occurred in the brain, but they found that that occurs in the brain. And interestingly enough, is that certain stages of the brain uh, induce that process better, um, specifically uh, in what we call slow wave sleep. Uh, the brain has actually replenished itself uh, better and is able to remove those waste products during that period of time than in other stages of sleep. The irony of that is, is that um, when you have uh, a traumatic brain injury and or you develop uh, different things like insomnia or uh, types of sleep disorder breathing, oftentimes we don't get into that slow wave sleep. And if we do, it's not very long. And so our recovery is not as good. And uh, what patients feel is they just don't feel refreshed in the morning they just don't feel like i've had a good night's rest you know uh, and so that's one of the things that we ask patients is when you wake up in the morning do you feel like you had a good night's rest and if they don't and if they don't feel like they've had restful sleep um then there's going to be some consequences and usually those consequences one of the biggest things that we say is obviously daytime sleepiness they're going to feel sleepy during the day uh, and so they're going to want to have a tendency to take multiple naps or, or they'll fall asleep doing monotonous things, you know, listening to a conversation, maybe listening to this podcast, no, you know, fall asleep. Uh, and so those things, and so we screen for those things and see if uh, those patients have those things. And then if they do, then obviously we know that sleep's been disrupted. Um and that can be for a variety of reasons. Obviously, in a traumatic brain injury, um, initially there's an inflammatory process. And, uh, and then, of course, there's oftentimes uh, one of the most common complaints that patients have that with, with brain injuries is they have a headache. They have pain. And uh, anytime that you have pain, it stimulates the nervous system to wake you up. Um, and you have to be able to uh, sleep, if you will, in order to have that restorative uh, process for your body. And if you don't, if you don't sleep, your pain threshold is not going to improve. You're going to continue to have pain. So that's one of the first things that uh, that obviously has to be addressed. Now, depending on the severity of the injury and things like that, you may be given medication. And of course, in my in my case, you know, I was I was you know I had broken bones and things, so they they gave me some pretty heavy duty stuff. And back in those days, uh, I remember my orthopedic surgeon told me he said, "Just call and we'll give you whatever you need." Uh, nowadays, they don't do that. Uh, nowadays, you have to see your doctor before you get another. Uh, another script for a narcotic, but uh, I was I was hurt pretty bad, and so I slept a lot. The irony of that is, is that medication that we give patients for sleep, whether it's narcotics or or sleep hypnotics or whatever, or benzodiazepines, whatever, they don't restore all the different stages of sleep. 
they may improve one aspect of sleep, but they don't improve another. Uh, it's not uncommon, for example, antidepressants to suppress REM sleep. And while REM sleep may not be the type of sleep that you need to be refreshed, refreshed, we know that REM sleep is important to solidify memories and things like that. And, and if you don't get that, um, your memory and things is going to be shot. You, your short-term memory is going to be about that, that big. And so we have to have all the stages of sleep. And unfortunately, pharmaceuticals don't do that very good. Uh, so there's we have to deal with other things and look at what's going on here that's interrupting our sleep. Is it, is it, uh, is it pain? Obviously, that needs to be dealt with. And uh, is it a psychiatric disorder? Is it insomnia? Is it sleep disordered breathing? Or do you have a change in your circadian cycle? You've, you've totally thrown off your sleep-wake cycle, and now you're trying to sleep when it's not your time to sleep. And, and that, those things just don't work. And so we see these different things. And so my job is to evaluate these patients and to try to figure out what category do you fit into and what do we need to do to affect your sleep? Um, obviously, the most of the things that we see, because I run a sleep lab, is uh, we see a lot of sleep disorder breathing. But one of the things that's really interesting is in traumatic brain injuries they found in veterans is that if you have developed some type of sleep disorder breathing, one of the things that occurs is it's not uncommon for you to wake up gasping and choking. And when that happens, um, it creates an arousal process, wakes you up, creates kicking in of the sympathetic neurons and things like that. That can trigger a post-traumatic event. That can, that can trigger <clears throat> those experiences, that, those traumatic experiences that they've had, whether they've been in military or, or everyday life or the things that go on that we see. And so we know that that's a triggering factor and that's something that needs to be addressed. And so that's, that's what we do. We, we address those things. That's such great information. So you mentioned some breathing how is sleep related to the autonomic system? Because I know that autonomics can be affected after brain injury and concussion. And Absolutely. so how did, would, if there's some issues with the autonomic system, how does that affect sleep? Well, what happens is when we go into the different stages of sleep, um, our, autonomic, our autonomic system turns on and turns off. And what's interesting is that um, if that's not working right, your ability to maybe get to sleep might be okay, but your ability to stay asleep might be compromised and you might start waking up. Uh, you may only sleep for two or three hours and then you wake up. Um, or in some patients, uh, they just have a hard time getting to sleep. So it's every, everybody is uh, very individualized, but it disrupts their sleep patterns somehow. And so we try to get that to restore the way it's supposed to. And that's, and that's a common complaint that we see. And, and of course, during the daytime, these people have everything from, you know, POTS disease to whatever. And, uh, and, and that creates a problem. What's really interesting is that if we can restore sleep, oftentimes these things kind of take care of themselves, which is really cool. Um, if the natural process is allowed to do its job, the body can heal and, and the body kind of takes care of itself. No, not always, but it's so many times over and over and over, we've, I've, I've seen this where once we restore sleep, uh, it's amazing how the people feel. And they say, so like, I haven't felt like this in years. And it doesn't matter whether it's a traumatic brain injury or, or, or some other process, but, but they feel so much better and it's so important that they sleep. And, and unfortunately, what you have to remember, sleep medicine is a new specialty. It's only been around since the late 70s. You know, we've had all these other specialties for a long time. Uh, the first, I think the first board certification in sleep medicine was 1978, you know. Uh, and so that was a long time. That was, you know, a few years ago, but in, in relative terms, 
that's 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 an infant compared to some of these other specialties, you know. Uh, so it hasn't. We don't really know that much about. We're still learning about sleep, and and we're going, oh my gosh, this affects sleep, and so we're constantly learning, and we don't have all the answers. And we're learning just like everybody else, but it it's so cool that once you can restore the sleep, uh, you just do so much better. And that's what I found. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. So how would somebody go about restoring sleep if they're listening and they're thinking, man, I have problems with sleep after my brain injury, but I don't even know where to start. Exactly. Fortunately... Uh, there's been a big push in medical education, and it started probably about 20 years ago uh, in that um, they're starting to teach uh, medical students and, and uh, whatever, chiropractic students, osteopathic students, whatever, about sleep in their early part of their training. And so they're they're beginning to focus, they, you know, this is a necessary process that the body has and so they they're beginning to teach them about how do you identify these things um what kind of questions do you need to ask so traditionally speaking um all of my patients come by referral and they're referred by their primary care practitioners whether that's a family doctor a nurse practitioner a pa um you know, a specialist or whatever, but they're all of our patients are by referral. And in their history and physical, they've obviously picked up on something that they realize is not working. Um, so we follow that up with what we call sleep questionnaire. And then we specifically ask about sleep. So one of the big screening tools that is required now by insurance companies is they want to see, for example, an upward sleepiness scale. Do you do you have excessive daytime sleepiness? In the military, they use the stop bang questionnaire. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. And those questionnaires basically are assessing your levels of daytime sleepiness. And if you have daytime sleepiness, that's a pretty good bet that you're not sleeping at night. Okay. Now, there's various causes for that. But then we question those patients and we do an exam and, and things and we say, okay, what is the, what category is this falling into? Um, is this some type of sleep disorder breathing, such as sleep apnea? Or is it a circadian rhythm problem, such as they're out of sync with their sleep-wake cycle? Uh, is, uh, is it some sort of parasomnia? Uh, where they're, or insomnia, where they're waking up uh, maybe at an early morning hour, and that may be attributed to their traumatic brain injury or, or whatever. The most common thing, about a third of Americans have insomnia, uh, whether they have traumatic brain injuries or not. That's a lot of people. Now, sleep disorder breathing is, um, if you look at the population as a whole, it's about four to six percent have some type of sleep disorder breathing as we get older that percentage increases uh, so as we get up to that medicare age we see a high percentage probably over 40 percent of patients that have that and obviously uh physical conditioning and weight and things like that have a an important element in that in fact for sleep disorder breathing the number one risk factor is are you obese uh, are you overweight if you are then that increases the likelihood of, of sleep disorder breathing. But the number two risk factor is um, what's your age? Are you over 50? And that, and we used to say 40, uh, but now we say 50. Um, the older we get, our tissue is not as elastic as it used to be. And so we begin to sag. Well, you know, you can see my face and things. It begins to sag a little bit. And, and of course, our airways do the same thing. And so we see more of these things. But it just kind of depends. And once we send these patients a, a questionnaire and, and we question them just a little bit more, maybe than their primary care practitioner, um, we can kind of gear them towards 
what what is the next step? Do we need to do um, some type of cognitive behavioral therapy? Or do we actually need to do a sleep study on you and evaluate you? Or do we need to just change some personal habits that you have at home? Um, and so it, it's everybody is a little bit different. That sleep questionnaire kind of helps to guide us in that in that thing. And uh, and the, the questions that we ask is, uh, let me see if I can remember them. Uh, <laughs> do you snore? Do you snore loudly? If you do, you got about a 60, 80% chance of having sleep apnea. Do you wake up gasping or choking? Do you ever have a head or, night, or head and neck sweats at night? Well, uh, autonomic dysfunction that we see in traumatic brain injuries, uh, we see that all the time, where they have autonomic manifestations such as sweating in their head and neck and things like that and may occur at, at, at nighttime. Um, do they move a lot in, in bed? Or, or in other words, do you fall asleep and you wake up in the same position? Or are you constantly tossing and turning? If you're constantly tossing and turning, that's a dead giveaway that something's not right. Um, something's just not right and that needs to be evaluated. Um, do you wake up with morning headaches? Um, for example, if you have sleep disorder breathing, um, we know that every apneic episode, your oxygen level is going to drop and your carbon dioxide level is going to rise. When that occurs, that's going to affect the blood vessels in your head. And so if you have a precondition such as a traumatic brain injury, and you might be kind of suffering from this anyway, it's just going to make it worse. So we have very effective treatments for those things, um, but we got to figure out which kind of category they're in. Are we dealing with a sleep-wake disorder? Are we dealing with a breathing disorder? Uh, are we dealing with some sort of uh, what we call parasomnia? Uh, parasomnias are abnormal things that occur in the night. Uh, like, for example, nightmares and things like that. Uh, and patients that have post-traumatic stress syndrome, oftentimes after TBIs, um, sometimes they'll develop things like parasomnias and things like that. And so uh, we try to address those things. And, and if we can take care of the basics, then these people do better and they do amazingly well. And uh, for example, in insomnia, which I mentioned before, a third of Americans have insomnia. Um, insomnia, the recommendation is before any medication. Uh, it's really sad because most people that have insomnia, the first thing their, their provider will do is throw some medication at you. And that's probably not the wisest thing to do. Uh, the treatment of choice or the number one treatment is some type of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I tell patients all the time that have like insomnia and things like that. I say, you know what? I can't force you to sleep, but I can sure make you want to sleep. <laughs> and we do that by various tricks. For example, we don't let them take naps during the day. We eliminate caffeine at certain parts of the day. Uh, sometimes we sleep deprive them as a therapy and we do that. Uh, so we use these natural things which can affect the normal physiological process. And, and if we can balance those things together, then the body just kind of takes care of itself and it heals so much better, so much better. So sorry, I'm rambling on. I'm sorry. No, it's great information. Thank you. Do not apologize. That's what you're here for. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's all really wonderful. I really appreciate you sharing those details and especially understanding that if there is a problem with sleep, there's probably some other sort of root cause is what I'm hearing. So yes. not everyone's going to have the same cause, but they might have no. this, they might all, all say they have trouble sleeping, but they yes. might all have different reasons behind it. And so it's really important to find why you specifically are having trouble sleeping. We, uh, I know intuitively now the, 
the American Psychiatric Association and things like that, they don't categorize them by like this. But in sleep medicine, what I like to do is I like to categorize patients that don't sleep very good. I want to find out is, do you have a hard time falling asleep? Or do you have a hard time staying asleep? And to me, that speaks volumes. If you're having a hard time falling asleep, I know one of a couple of things is going on. Number one, your circadian cycle may not, or your sleep-wake cycle may not be in sync. In other words, you're trying to go to sleep at the wrong time. Uh, you don't fall asleep until one or two o'clock, but yet you're going to bed at nine. And you're just going to sit there for two, three hours counting sheep. And, and it's just not going to work. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing that when we see sleep uh, onset insomnia, oftentimes there is an associated, if you will, psychiatric or psychological problem. It's not uncommon to have anxiety. Uh, people can't turn their mind off. And so when they tell me that they have sleep onset insomnia, I go, okay, uh, what does your mind do when you go to bed? Oh my gosh, I'm just rehearsing. My mind's just going a million miles a minute. I can't turn it off. So one of the little tricks that I like to do, I mean, yeah, you could say datum and stuff and try to do that, but we like to take their mind off things. Uh, generally speaking, we don't do this for everybody, but one of the little tricks that I like to do is say, hey, if you can't wind your mind down, I need your mind focused on something else. We distract them. Now, that distraction can be a TV. So put a TV on in your bedroom and, and watch a program. Now, granted, that's not good for our sleep-wake cycle uh, <laughs> in that it affects, uh, it affects our circadian cycle. But what it does is it distracts them. And if they're going to do that, they have to have a timer on their TV. And so usually what happens is these patients they'll need maybe an hour or so and so if they put their tv on and they put a sleep timer on it if they're watching a show and the more boring the show is or, or the more they get involved kind of you can look at it one of two ways uh it distracts their minds and so instead of them thinking about the processes of the day or Johnny did this to me, or Mabel said this to me, or this happened or that happened, and all the drama that people go through, we get away from that. And we just kind of let their minds just kind of vegetate and just kind of go, you know, just go into la la. And, and so that's one of the little tricks. Would a podcast or an audio book do something similar? Yeah, audiobooks. That's a, that's great. Th those are, yeah, I was just going to mention that. Yeah. Audiobooks are good. Um, some people reading does that for me, if I want to go to sleep and I'm not, uh, oh my gosh, I start reading when it's time to go to bed and I start reading, I'm going to like, ugh. and pretty soon I'm going to zonk out really quick. Um, not all people are like that. Some people, when they read it, it keeps them up, but audio books, music, um, uh, hearing the ocean, hearing the rain. Uh, I know for myself. When it rains and it's storming, I sleep like a baby. <laughs> I can sleep through a storm. Uh, it's great. I like it. <laughs> but but that's just me. Uh, uh, and so everybody is a little bit different. So that's, that's one of the little tricks that we use. Uh, if they're waking up in the early morning hours, then we start thinking about things like some type of either psychiatric problem or maybe a sleep disorder breathing problem. And, um, and so we start, you know, when you wake up in, in, in after two, three hours, what, what time of the night do you wake up? Are you having a nightmare? Or are you, are you, you know, are you sleepwalking and then you wake up, you know, what's going on? And so that kind of helps kind of guide us which direction we need to go. Invariably, patients that have sleep disorder breathing, like sleep apnea, they go to sleep and every time they have an apneic episode, they actually wake up now and they have what we call an arousal. And arousals usually last for about 15 seconds. And most of the time, people don't even remember those. If they're short 
arousals from sleep, you're totally amnestic of them. You don't remember them at all. But if it's the longer arousals that, that you remember longer, that you remember uh, the best when, um, when you're awake for longer. Uh, I always tell this story when I'm teaching, and, and this is such a classic story. The very first study that I ever did uh, years and years ago was, was a veteran, and he complained of, um, he said, I don't have trouble falling asleep. He said, I can't stay, I can't stay asleep. And anyway, so I did a sleep study on him and I asked him in the morning, how many times did you wake up? And he said, I woke up three times. I said, really? And I just laughed. And he goes, why are you laughing? You know, that's kind of a rude thing to do. But he, but I said, no, you woke up 300 times last night, 300 times. He goes, I did? I said, yes. He had no clue. He had no clue. And remember, when we talked about the autonomics, every time you wake up from an apneic episode, if you will, there's a sympathetic barrage that makes the heart go boom, 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 makes you break out in a sweat, uh, you know, raises your blood pressure and all that sort of stuff. And can you imagine doing that hundreds of times a night? What do you think the consequences are going to be the next day? What do you think you're going to feel like? Number one, you're not going to feel like you had a very good night's sleep to begin with. And number two, you're going to affect basically every system of the body. You're going to affect your cardiovascular system. You're going to affect your endocrine system. You're going to affect your gastrointestinal system. You can affect your nervous system. You're going to show effects in every part of your body. And so those things have to be addressed. Um, are they psychiatric? Or are they, and if they're psychiatric, I, I, I remember when I was in medical school and I remember doing a psych rotation and the psychiatrist, uh, one of the things she had me do is I would go in and I would evaluate the patient first. I would, you know, talk to him and do a physical on him. And then I would write up my little thing and then I'd come back and show the psychiatrist and she would say, yay or nay, or, you know, yes, this is good. And she gave me some really good advice. She said, she said, Dr. Wilkins, she said, when you have a psychiatric problem, the first thing that's going to change before a psychiatric episode or a depressive episode or an anxiety episode, an effective episode, he said, the first thing that you're going to see is a change in their sleep patterns. And I go, really? And she goes, yes, that's going to show up first. Uh, you'll see that first. Uh, their sleep patterns are going to change. And when you see that, then you start keying in on those key questionnaires that, you know, the key questions that we need to ask. And that, and I found that to really be helpful advice. And so that's, uh, that's one of the things that we have to do. Now, the irony of it is, is that oftentimes, if you can get them back to sleep, Oftentimes, the psychiatric disorder or the psychological disorder improves or may even go away on its own. Now, sometimes it doesn't, and, you know, and I don't mean to say that there's no need to ever see a, you know, a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, that's not true. Yeah, sometimes you have to. But if we can sleep, these things can, can go away. You know, in traumatic brain injury, you know, who do they usually see? Uh, initially for pain, you're going to see, you know, the, the family doctor, the internist, whatever they may send you to a pain specialist, blah, blah, blah. But when these things persist, who do they start sending you to? Psychiatry or maybe some sort of uh, neurology. And, and that's typically the route that they go to. And, and, and it's, don't get me wrong, these, these doctors, they're doing the best that they can. And this is how they've been trained. Uh, medical physicians are trained to give pharmaceuticals and, and sometimes that works, but you know, that's what they train. That's what they're trained to do. And sometimes that may not be the best thing. Sometimes there's other things that can either complement that, or we can even do without that. Um, but that's how they're trained and no offense, no offense to medical physicians, 
That's how they're trained. They're good people. They're trying to do the best that they can. It's just that they're taught a certain bias. And uh, uh, that's what's so cool about sleep medicine is that we realize that if you don't sleep, it affects all these other areas. And let's get them to sleep. And sometimes these things will just kind of take care of themselves. And that's what's so cool about my job. That's so great. Thanks for sharing. And you were trained as in in neurology. I was. I was uh, uh, you have an MD, right? Well, I am an I am an MD and I'm a DC. Okay. Uh, I I I'm a chiropractic neurologist by training. Yeah. Um, I don't practice medicine. I mm-hmm. I practice chiropractic medicine, if you will. Mm-hmm. I practice sleep medicine. That's all I do. Yeah. Uh, the majority of my time. I'm looking at sleep studies and I am writing a report and giving recommendations. And so I'm, because they're not my patients. These are patients that have been sent to us. And so I'm sending these patients back to their referring provider and saying, okay, this is what we need to do. That's Uh, You know, you need to get them this device or we need to do this, or you need to send them over and do this. And so that's, that's my job. That's what I do. So for our listeners, you'd probably recommend if they are having trouble with sleep to get some sort of sleep study or to see a sleep medicine doctor. Yeah, you, you, you do. You sleep medicine doctors are, there's not enough of them around. So usually the first route is you see your primary care practitioner, whether that's a a PA, a chiropractor, an MD, a DO, family doctor, you know, whatever. And, and you talk to them. And, and you tell them, I'm, I'm having trouble sleeping. And they may ask a few questions and, and because they, they want to know, is this psychiatric related or is this related to something else? Um, there are certain, for example, insomnia by itself is not a good enough indication to get a sleep study. You have to have something else. Like, do you snore? Do you get up at night to go to the bathroom? Do you have head and neck sweats? Uh, do you wake up gasping or choking? Do you have morning headaches? Uh, you know, if you've had those things, then yeah, let's get a sleep study. I think morning headaches would definitely be a something that a lot of brain injury survivors can relate to. I know yes. for me, there'll be days I would just wake up in yes. pain before I open Absolutely. my eyes. Absolutely. So um, we we do that, and then we'll do the sleep study. And the parameters that we're looking at on the sleep study is, first of all, we're looking at the brain waves. Now, so we're looking at an EEG. Uh, Now, in sleep medicine, the EEGs that we do are a shotgun approach EEG. They're a screen. We're not looking at every part of the brain. We're specifically, usually we have a a couple of electrodes centrally, a couple of electrodes frontally, and a couple of electrodes uh, occipitally. Uh, Usually, unless we suspect a seizure disorder or something like that, we usually don't put electrodes on the temporal lobes or anything like that but we're looking at sleep and we want to identify sleep how long does it take you to fall asleep how long do you stay asleep and what stages of sleep do you go into and that tells us volumes about your health for example uh, patients who are sleep deprived will do a couple of different things. Number one, they have a hard time going into slow wave sleep, okay? Number two, they stay in light sleep, which is if you're in light sleep, uh, that's stage one or stage two sleep, it's easy to be aroused. It doesn't take so much to wake you up. You hear a car outside that wakes you up. Someone slams the door, that wakes you up. You hear a TV in the other room, that wakes you up. And so in light sleep, we're going to see that type of thing. The other thing that we see when they're sleep deprived is if they're really sleep deprived, we'll see them go into REM sleep at an earlier than supposed to. Normally REM sleep should kick in at about, once you fall asleep, should kick in about 80 to 120 minutes. Okay. And and you should cycle between all your different stages. Um, You should cycle between all your different stages you know, about every 90 to 120 minutes, and you should cycle through that. But 
when we see people who are sleep deprived really bad for whatever reason, psychiatric, sleep disorder breathing, traumatic brain injury, it doesn't matter. If they're really sleep deprived, we see that REM sleep coming on early. And, the, and, and that speaks volumes. And I go, holy cow, you are really sleep deprived. No wonder you say that you're sleepy during the day. And so then we have to investigate those things. And, and of course, you know, once in a great while, um, and, and there has been a little bit of association between this and development later on, but uh, you can develop things like narcolepsy. You know, if, if you've heard of that. Uh, and these people fall asleep at the drop of a hat. These people are more sleepy than patients that have sleep apnea. Um, for example, when we have every patient fill out an Epworth sleepiness skill. And abnormal is 10 or more. And severe, I would consider 16 or more. And when they get up to 18 or more on that Epworth sleepiness scale, I, that brings a red flag in my mind. And I start thinking about things like narcolepsy. And I start thinking about some of these other disorders um, because regular sleep apnea, yes, it makes you sleepy, but it doesn't make you sleepy as some of these other disorders. And so, so those are little cues that we use and which bring up red, bell, uh, red flags for us that we can investigate further. But usually your provider will kind of do a broad screen to see if you need a sleep study. Um, most patients can actually do a home sleep study, okay? Uh, the only problem with the home sleep study is there's, there's certain limitations. Number one, with a traditional home sleep study, one of the things you're not looking at is you're not looking at brain waves. Um, we're looking at other things that we see that when you fall asleep, but we don't look at brain waves. The definitive way to tell if you've fallen asleep is we got to look at your brain waves. And that's that's called the polysomography. Okay. Uh, but if if you're uh, uh, you suspected some type of sleep disorder breathing, you don't necessarily need to see the brain waves because we can we can monitor the flow coming up the nose and the mouth and we can monitor the heart rate and your chest breathing and stuff like that. And so most people can do a home sleep study. And there are some contraindications for home sleep studies. Uh, people that have parasomnias, people that have uh, restless leg syndrome. Um, if you're under 18 years of age, uh, you shouldn't have a home sleep study. And so there are some different factors. But for the most part, most people can have it. Uh, if you're at high altitude, like our lab is, uh, we're at 7,000 feet. And high altitude... Uh, often induces a different type of sleep apnea that we don't see with lowlanders. <laughs> and so that's a contraindication for us for a home sleep study. So we don't actually personally in our lab, we don't do very many home sleep studies because, uh, because we're at such high altitude, but uh, those are different things that we look at and, uh, and we can correct those things and, and kind of go from there. And, and I hope I'm telling you what you need to know. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe this is going to be helpful for those listening. So thank you. Now, the last thing I really want to ask you is what are some things people can do at home? What are some habits? I've heard of sleep hygiene and different things that people can just kind of start where they are, start today once they're done listening to this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, for whatever reason, and, and it's it's really funny, you would think that people would intuitively know these things but I'm shocked and amazed at how bad of sleep habits that we develop. When it gets close to bedtime, the average person, you know, goes to bed nine to 10, 11 o'clock, okay? As it gets close to bedtime within an hour or two, the first thing that needs to happen is the lights need to be dimmed down in the house. The worst thing that can happen uh, for a sleep disorder is bright lights okay so you don't want to go to bed after you've been exposed to all these bright lights because there's an arousal process there and and it does lights have the tendency to either synchronize or change your circadian cycle your sleep wake cycle so if you're going to bed and then and then the other bad thing is are you are you taking your 
<laughs> your phone and are, are you reading with it or watching a movie or something like that? Um, the bright lights from that, just from that, is enough to shift your sleep-wake cycle from normal to delay it. And so you might be delayed till 12, 1, 2 o'clock, but yet you think, oh, and this is a common thing that people do. Oh, I'm not getting enough sleep, so I'm going to go to bed earlier. Worst thing you could do. Worst thing you could do. Uh, we tell patients, in fact, when we bring patients in for sleep studies, within limits, we try to get them as close to their normal sleep time as possible. If you go to bed at 10 o'clock, we try to bring you at 9 because it's going to take us, you know, 30, 40 minutes to get you hooked up. And then by the time we're going through all the paperwork and stuff, we're in, we got you in bed about the time that you normally go to bed. Uh, Patients that have a shift in their cycle, and you can shift it forward or you can shift it backwards. Older people have a tendency to shift forward. Younger, younger adults have a tendency to shift it backwards. So, and you know this, how many young adults do you know? Uh, and they're night owls. They like to stay out at night. <laughs> and, and, and then they come in and, and, that's great for the weekend, but if it shifted your sleep-wake cycle and you've got to get up at, in the morning at six o'clock in the morning and your sleep-wake cycle has shifted, you're going to bed at nine o'clock and you're laying there awake all night. And then finally about one o'clock, you fall asleep and then you've got to get up at six o'clock. You've only had five hours of sleep. You're sleep deprived. You definitely have to you have to affect that. So that so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing that we do is uh, obviously when you go to bed, it needs to be dark, cool, and quiet. Okay, um, our body temperature begins to drop as we fall asleep, and in fact, in certain stages of sleep, what well, we actually don't regulate body temperature very good at all in REM sleep. Um, and so studies have shown that as the temp if your body core temperature begins to drop as you're going to sleep, you actually go into a deeper stage of sleep and you actually feel more restful. So that's something that needs to be taken care of. So kind of a little bit cool. Okay. Uh, you don't need to have it uh, 80 degrees because it's winter time and there's two foot of snow on the ground. You know, turn the temperature down just a little bit and, uh, and, and you'll do a little bit. Now, obviously we don't want you getting sick or anything like that, but uh, turn that temperature down. Um, the other thing that we tell patients is um, no caffeinated beverages after about 12 noon. You can have coffee, you can have tea, you can have sodas, you can have monster drinks, you can have whatever you want up until that time. After that, we don't want you doing it. And the reason being, caffeine interferes and actually antagonizes a chemical in our body called adenosine. And adenosine is a natural byproduct of cellular metabolism. And as the adenosine levels build up in your system, you get sleepier. Caffeine inhibits that. And it does so for about six to eight hours. Now, some people can metabolize a little bit faster than others, but generally speaking, six to eight hour rule is, is the rule of thumb. So no caffeine within six to eight hours of bedtime. That's a no-no, okay? Uh, I don't know how many people we say, oh, what do you do to go to bed? I drink a cup of coffee. <laughs> or I have a soda. Or we've even had people come to the sleep lab and it, it, it cracks me up. They bring in these, you know, a 44 ounce drink and a, a soda, a Coke or something like that. And they set it on the bedside. I have to have this to sleep at night. And I'm going, uh, no, you don't. <laughs> this is making my job harder. Uh, and so, so we do that. In the morning when it's time to wake up, um, you know, after you've been in bed for seven, eight hours, it's time to get up. Don't linger in bed. Uh, get up. Get up and get exposed to light. The brighter the light, the better. 
in fact, we can we use light therapy to shift patients' circadian cycles, whether they're advanced or whether they're delayed. And so at different times of the day, we can expose these to light um, and, and do that. And so those are the basic things that everybody should be doing. Quiet room, dark room, cool temperature, dim lights, and don't expose yourself to, to bright lights while you're in bed. Uh, we tell patients, bed is for two things. Bed is for sleep and sex, okay? We don't want you doing your homework in bed. We don't want you balancing your checkbook in bed. We don't want you on Facebook in bed and typing your story throughout the day. No, no. Your bedroom is for sleep and sex. That's it, okay? And, and because sometimes we can actually become psychologically dependent upon some of those other things if we do them, uh, do them enough. And so we want to eliminate those things. So those, those are the basic things. And that's, that's what we call sleep hygiene. So nothing that's going to stimulate you. And uh, remember, oh, and the other th bad thing is alcohol. Alcohol puts people to sleep. It does. But it wakes you up early. So during the night, you'll actually fragment your sleep from the alcohol. So alcohol is a no-no uh, before bedtime, whether it's a martini, whether it's a beer, you know, whether, whatever it is. If you're going to drink any type of alcohol, it needs to be several hours before you go to bed. Um, alcohol and sleep do not go together. And in fact, in almost every report that we do, um, we caution them about two things. Um, alcohol and tobacco will increase sleep disorder breathing should be avoided. Okay, smoking does that too. Um, so we tell them, don't do those things. Um, people have bad habits and they do those things, but uh, they actually make alcohol and tobacco make sleep disorder breathing worse. And that doesn't matter if you're vaping, you're smoking, a cigar, a cigarette, a pipe, or even chewing tobacco. It, it still gets into the system and it still affects your sleep. Don't do it. Don't do it. So that's the big thing. That's the biggest thing that people can start with, those that simple sleep hygiene. And that's going to affect a lot of people. Thanks for sharing that. You know, I think that the phone thing is something that I know that I have a problem with, and I think a lot of people do, probably especially younger, young adults, like you said, teens, um, but anyone at any age, we're so used to our phones, and we use them as our alarm clocks. So yes. they're on our bedside table. So, you know, I, I am good at putting it on do not disturb before I go to sleep so that I don't wake up because I am a light sleeper, which after hearing you speak probably has to do with my autonomic. I have dysautonomia, so it's probably part of that. Yeah. So I am good at that. But I mean, I'll be sending my friends texts late at night, you know, just like, you know, how, how was your day talking to them over text before I go to bed and probably not the best idea. No, no, it's it's not a good thing to do. We all do it. Hey, <laughs> I'm raising my hand. This goes to bed with me. And when I'm bored, you know, I'm looking on Facebook or, or whatever. I, I'm guilty. But we for those of guilty. us with brain injuries that we're having such a hard time sleeping, like I heard you say over and over again throughout this whole conversation that when you sleep better, you heal better. And Absolutely. so if we're actively trying to work on our healing from our brain, the best thing we can do is do everything in our power. So don't go on your phone. Don't bring it to bed. You know, do get an alarm clock or something else that you can use instead of your phone because we are trying to actively help our brains to heal the best we possibly can. Yeah, so you're with, exactly right. With that said, the final question I always ask all of our guests, this podcast is called Hope Survives Podcast. So what are some final words of hope that you would have for our listeners today? There's help. There's help. And, and the body is amazing. The body can heal. Um, I've known this from personal experience. And, and even to this day, I've, I, I, I notice improvement. Um, 
in my head injury, uh, I was smacked in the head right here. I had a big contusion on my frontal lobe. And uh, initially, I was Mr. Passive. I was super nice when I came into the hospital. And then as that began to heal, uh, as you know, your frontal lobe is where your inhibition centers are and things like that. I got mean. It's really sad, but I did. I got mean and I had a hard time controlling my emotions and things like that. But in time, as I healed and, and my brain injury was, you know, back in 98. And I still think that I'm still healing. Um, and there are things of, of my life and my personality that I, that I try to work on. And, and I've noticed a difference. And those things do better. And they do, they will heal. There is help. Uh, and your brain and your body can heal itself. Um, sleep is a good, it is part of that big equation. But there's hope. And you do heal. And it's just not for the first 18 months or year or two after you, after you have an injury, which is, yes, where the majority of healing does occur. It occurs over years. So don't give up. If you have a setback, it's okay. We all do. We all do. There's hope. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilkins. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the podcast today. If our listeners want to get in touch with you, is there a good way for that? Sure. The easiest way to probably... The easiest way to get a hold of me is probably, um, you know, I do have a website. I don't know what it is. Just email me. Um, my email, I'll give you out my email. It's uh, Roy D. Wilkins, W-I-L-K-I-N-S at hotmail.com. Uh, that's probably the easiest thing. And and I, uh, because I do teach some postgraduate neurology and stuff, I, I, I get emails asking about sleep uh, all the time. In fact, yesterday I, I commented on an email that came to me about a new device and where it attaches to the tongue and then actually helps sleep apnea. And they wanted to know my opinion on that and things like that. And so I do give my advice about things. Um, and, and I'll be happy to, uh, unless I just get inundated and have to <laughs> go incognito or something like that, I try to answer the emails that are directed to me and things like that. And I don't have a problem with that. I'm getting to the tail end of my career. And so I'm slowing down, which means I have more time. I don't spend as much time in, in the clinic. I uh, just, I probably work less than 10 hours a week, you know, and, and most of the time I work from my computer like we're at right now. Uh, most of the time I'm not seeing patients. And so I have a lot more time than I, than I used to. And, and I don't mind if you want to send me an email and you have questions, uh, I can answer those questions in email. And, and once in a while we have to do a phone consult or, or I've even had to do telemedicine consults with people that have asked me about different things. And I'm not opposed to doing that, but just contact me through my email first. And then we we can go from there and, and I can give you some advice if you need to. And I'm not the world's greatest expert on sleep. I can tell you that right now. And I'm not the greatest doctor. There's so much more that people know than I do, but I am a fellow brain injury patient. So been there, done that. <laughs> and that's all I can tell you. That's so generous so. of you. Thank you. I will definitely put your information in the description so that our listeners can view that. So okay, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. And uh, yeah, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Alrighty. Thank you.